arakatuhum wa humumuhum wa uzumuhum lillahi la lil khalqi wa shaytan ni'mar rafiq li talib as-subul allati tufdi ila al khayrat wal ihsan tufdi ila al khayrat wal ihsan bismillahirrahmanirrahim alhamdulillah rabbil alamin la aqbalu wa la taqim wa la udwana illa ala zalimin um just wanted to just make a quick video in this blessed place this blessed book of madina munawwara Literally sitting here, uh, this is Masjid Nabawi, beautiful place. Now, many people asked and wanted to know my journey. Well, I just thought I would just maybe summarize it. Won't keep it too long. Uh, won't bore you all uh, with the uh, the information. But I come from a place, Northwest London, where I was raised. I was born in London, and uh, you know, had a normal upbringing, like many others. Despite the fact that I was an orphan, raised my father, Allah happily passed away when I was six years old. So raised by my mother, Zalla Khair. Fast forward and went to high school, what have you. You know, I had different paths up and down, slobby slopes. Alhamdulillah. But at the end of the day, Allah is the guiding me, and I'll never forget my father, Allah. He was the means of me loving Salah. So eventually, when I started practicing, Zalla Khair, when I was younger, I always called him always to me. Praying at the house, praying next to me, taking me to the masjid. Mm-hmm. Alhamdulillah, I had the love for salah due to the fact that I used to always see and pray, which is important for all the fathers out there to always make sure that your means of your own offspring see what they're doing. So when I was younger, I'll never forget when I come back from school, for example, we pray salah, and I said to get they always call me. Even though I was still in my school uniform and stuff, they always called me to pray salah. So eventually, alhamdulillah, when I started, uh, Practicing when I was in year nine by the Fadl of Allah, it was something that was, it wasn't new to me, praying salah, but just that obviously I wasn't taking it seriously. And I changed my companions. I had companions, those brothers that used to go to the Masala inside the school, which is also another message as well to the brothers out there to make sure you have good companionship. Because when you do have good companionship, it does help you be for those that are able to actually see yourself that you're able to always have the companionship around yourself. Because that helps. And Marad Adin Khalili Kana Qana Nabi Sallallahu A person is upon the religion of their companion. So, I got married. Actually, no, before that, before that. Um, I went, I did an IT apprenticeship, alhamdulillah. Got a job, became an IT engineer. And then I wanted to seek knowledge. And I wanted to seek knowledge. That was something that I always wanted to do. And uh, how I came about it, was the fact that I uh, how I came about it uh, it's kind of difficult actually to report whilst got so many parts of the English and I walk the past love but I love it so that my life is just accepted from the moment and accepted from us all so how I came about it was that my brother he encouraged me into you know practicing the deed and gave me da'wah but then I was said if here and I remember going to my first conference when I was young. Um, I think I was in year nine, end of year nine, year ten. So I did actually know about Salafi in the beginning, but rather it was something that I went through. I remember I got called to Tablighism. They wanted to take me to the masjid. I'll never forget that. And then from there, uh, I saw it. I remember I'll never forget leaving the masjid going, saying we're going to go for da'wah, knocking on people's doors. I was like, I don't have any knowledge to come to people's doors. They'll try and get me up to sign the mission. So the message where I prayed in, it was a, upon that. But alhamdulillah, for me, it didn't make sense. And I, I didn't really, didn't, it wasn't welcoming for me. It didn't make sense. Just randomly go up in these doors at random times in London. Anyway, then afterwards, um, I went through, uh, I don't know if people that are around at the time, MBAD, um, helping out volunteering. But once again, the whole vibes, it didn't really, it didn't really feel well for me. Fast forwarded, eventually, I decided that I wanted to apply for the uni because I always had uh, uh, a love for learning the Arabic language. I wanted to learn the Arabic language and I knew that it didn't make sense because I remember one of the first scholars that I started listening to was Sheikh Sheikh Bani. Sheikh Sheikh Bani, rahimahullah. And uh, my brother used to always send me like videos and show me 
shift money then i started listening to here shift for me shift for so i started listening to scholars on youtube but with subtitles so it's on youtube but subtitles and this is also once again something that always encouraged the brothers that went to the arabic even though you can't understand arabic language listen to it along with the subtitles in any language that you're proficient so moving forward uh what happened was that i applied for the university and then eventually when i applied for the university i i went and i asked for my uh, wife now my yeah, preserver. Um, I spoke to her father-in-law, Mark Lovig, and then afterwards, eventually, I managed to uh, get married. And Subhanallah, what it was was that three days after I did the nikah, I'll never forget. I actually went to Medina and I travelled to Medina, and here I am today. Subhanallah, more than ten years from when I first came here. Subhanallah. The funny thing is that I actually prayed my first salah in Masjid Nabawi. Salat al Asr, I'll never forget. I landed <laughs> and I missed my flight, my connecting flight from Jeddah to Medina. So I landed in Jeddah. I was exhausted. I was completely shattered. So I actually landed in Jeddah. I had a connecting flight in the nighttime. But I was so shattered. I, to, I went to the Musalla, took a quick nap. But, and then I looked at the time ticket and it was actually, I think, 8 30. Sorry, no. It was, it was, I believe, 12 o'clock. But I thought, 12 o'clock was the time when we were supposed to go there. But the actual fly was for 12 o'clock. So anyway, I missed the fly, got a taxi, arrived in Medina, prayed, so I thought I said, and that's when I first ever met a scholar in Masjid Nabawi, which is Sheikh Anash Abdul Sana Abad, may Allah preserve him. But beforehand, alhamdulillah, I had managed to meet. So the first scholar I think I actually met was Sheikh Mahir Qahtani. Sheikh, Sheikh Mahir Qahtani. He came to UK, I was in high school at the time, and then after him, Sheikh Hassan al Banna, Rahimahullah ta'ala, Rahmatullah Wasi, was an amazing scholar. Uh, and, and then afterwards, I met Sheikh Ali, Mid Zayd al Mithani, may Allah Azza wa Jal, have uh, mentioned the scholars that have passed away, and the scholars that are still alive. Anyway, so I had that love, and I wanted to be, be, be uh, a student of knowledge, I wanted to come. I came to Medina, alhamdulillah, I got accepted, and eventually I came. So I studied, alhamdulillah, and uh, we'll do another video about my experiences here, inshallah. We'll really, I will try my best to relive my experience, the place I used to go, now I used to study and what have you. But eventually, I graduated. Now, the big question, why did I actually leave? Um, for those that don't actually know, I didn't actually voluntarily leave. I didn't want to leave, I just thought hard to leave, I wanted to leave Medina. But rather, it was due to the fact that um, I'm the youngest in my family. My mother, Allah, from her, may Allah Azza wa Jal, she wants to turn to the sky. All her mother, may Allah preserve them. So she missed me. You know, it's been many years, basically ten years. So I thought, you know, I'll go back to be, you know, a righteous son and uh, my in-laws as well. This is my wife. So they decided to go back because of that. But really and truly, our hearts, our hearts were still in it. They were yearning for me. So the question is now, I'm back. I remember I went back to, uh, to London 2021 and I stayed for two years and I went to wait. Why did I make Hijra? Why did I leave? Did I make Hijra really and truly? Now look, I advise all the brothers out there and the sisters, for those that want to make Hijra, because of course we know Islamically there are certain conditions that which pertains to making Hijra. It's a serious thing. And what we were advised many times by the scholars as well is to make the intention of seeking knowledge because if you make Hijra and something goes wrong, then you go back and you are sinning. Except for, of course, the three different reasons why you're allowed to go back to the country that left and you migrated from. So I made the intention to leave the UK for the sake of my children and the sake of their, their religion and our religion. Because at the end of the day, UK is a place, subhanAllah, where so when you think about it, subhanAllah, brothers and sisters, and anywhere in the West, there's no future for our children, let alone us Muslims. Okay? The Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, says, أَنَا بَرِيءٌ لِمَنْ يَعِيشُ بَيْنَا I am free from those that live amongst the non-Muslims and they can see each other's highs, meaning they're close to each other, they live amongst the same places, you know. And of course, we know the ayah when Allah as says, Man you hide it fi sabirillah, he did fil muradum and kathiran wa sa'an. Whoever makes the intention and makes the intention of leaving, migrating a place for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jalla, when you make hijrah, then Allah Azza wa Jalla will provide for them and they will find abundant sustenance of the vision. So there's no reason for you know for you to stay. You know, Alhamdulillah, they made it easy as well to for you to live in different places on the earth in the Muslim land. It's easy. I'm not saying it's going to be completely easy, but it's possible. 
Okay, let me make that. Let me correct that. It is possible. So anyway, brothers and sisters, I've come to Kuwait, and the reason I chose Kuwait was because of the fact that it's tax free. You can get in there, and Masha'Allah, Mark, but man, so many prominent scholars. I mean, it's, it's you. You literally you're, you're spoiled for choice. So that's why I, I believe that it was important for me to come to a place where I was able to get into the country. And when you think about it, brothers and sisters, I mean, we have to make sacrifices, right? I left behind my car, beautiful MG car, house, beautiful family, you know, beautiful, amazing job. I mean, I was working like three hours a day, three to four hours a day as an engineer in IT, and I was living up. It was amazing, but I had to think about my family, my children, my offsprings. I didn't want to be in a situation where 15, 20 years down in line, I'm, you know, maybe tomorrow I'm dead, and then my children are being raised and they're living in non Muslim lands. Who knows if you know, my future generation from my offsprings will be Muslims. And that's the scary part. Or maybe, you know, they'll be killed or get into a situation, predicament where it's not their fault. And that's the, that's the West, unfortunately. When you live in a Muslim country, you know, you leave your keys in the ignition, you can live a life where you're stress-free, no problems, no issues. And that's the best. So that's the reason why I decided to, to leave. Another reason is I got a knock at the door by the feds. <laughs> Yes, I did. The police came to my house, subhanAllah. Um, and once again, you're in a situation where that can easily happen to you. I didn't do anything wrong. And this happened not once, but twice. And I thought to myself, you know what? I can't do this. So that's the reason why I put myself, you know what? My children as well, they're being raised in a country where anything can happen. It can go, they will. Look, don't get me wrong. As he died in Allah, it's so deal. Okay? He died in Allah. Well, that's not my demon, inshallah. Allah has ordered us along and that's who he was. But when we live in a Muslim environment, it does make a difference. The West is not a place, brothers and sisters, for, you know, their children to be raised in. When you live in a place where, yes, it's comfortable. Don't get me wrong. Living in the West is comfortable, but at the end of the day, you don't know what's going to happen at any moment of time. Anything could happen. And that's it. And subhanAllah, I'll never forget the statement of Fudayl ibn Iyad, in Allah, where it's mentioned in Shaykh Bukhzaf, Shaykh Bukhzaf, Shaykh Bukhzaf mentioned this beautiful statement where a lot of people believe that they can be in a place like living in the West where, you know, maybe they're given that with some people as well. Don't get me wrong. Once again, look, I'm not judging anyone. I'm not saying that this is this should be the case or not. I'm just giving you an example and this statement from the Salaf. So he mentioned that a person can get a lot of rib, a lot of profit by guiding people to Islam, calling them to Tawheed, to Sunnah, which is khair, Allah is beautiful. And this is from the means of why some scholars do say they differ on the matter, but they do say that you can live in the non-Muslim lands for this, if you're given da'wah. Now look, look what Fudayl ibn Iyad says, but one person can do this, where they give da'wah, call people, people become Muslim, due to him after the father of Allah, but they lose ra'as al-mal. Yudhi'i minhu ra'as al-mal, meaning the capital, who's the capital? They lose the capital, but yet they gain a profit. Gaining a profit is the fact that your children become, uh, sorry, that people become Muslim. And, you know, you guide people, you teach people Islam. But you lose the capital, which is your family members, i.e. your wives and your offsprings. They lose Islam, maybe, or maybe they become misguided. And this is literally the tax that you're going to be paying by living in Muslim lands. So that's our lie, brothers and sisters. To end this, um, I encourage every single person to make sure they strive the utmost best to make the means of leaving the non-Muslim lands and live within the Muslim lands. And it could be just an intention of you making an intention of seeking knowledge. When are you going to be able to read the Quran? When are you going to be able to start reading the Quran? Your children, Arabic, all of the stuff, sitting under the scholars. Are you going to wait until all the scholars have died? So many of them, subhanAllah, as I'm walking through the haram today, I'm seeing so many of the chairs where the scholars would sit and they're no longer there. They're no longer there. So this is something that, you know, don't wait until it's too late, brothers and sisters. Don't wait until it's too late. But one thing I do advise and I recommend that each and every single one of us do is that they strive to making a better place and a better means of environment, which is at the, these places of the Muslim lands for your offsprings. And this won't only benefit you, but it will benefit your children and your children to come. And we ask Allah to make it easy for us.